Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. We have a good show for you guys today. We're just kind of kind of go off the cuff for this first segment. We had a couple discussions via text, Horwat, about the Pittsburgh Penguins trade block and, and really how it's kind of been depleted. I mean, mm-hmm. Kyle Dubas kind of traded away his entire trade block this offseason. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about the Kyle Dubas offseason as a whole. And then, of course, we'll be joined by a good friend of the show, State of Hoppy, to close out the episode as he gives his thoughts on the Pittsburgh Penguins offseason and what lies ahead for the 2023-24 Pittsburgh Penguins. But Horwat, before we get into all of that, have you ever tried to make bread before? Yes and no. I've tried to make, I've never actually tried to make actual like sourdough or just regular bread. Okay. Cause you uh, see where I'm going with it. Yeah. But I have whipped together uh, a peanut butter bread before. Ooh. Uh, and that was very good. Literally, you don't need the regular peanut butter. Just slap some jelly on it and you have yourself a sandwich. Yeah. Um, but that's it bread wise. I'm not that big yeah. of a baker. Uh, mm. I am more of just a uh, food cook. Uh, whenever it comes to cooking i do want to bake more i do need to start baking more i want to make bread sometime uh maybe this will be the little push to make me to do it there you go i mean the extent of mine is like 12th grade home ec and i made banana bread that's it Mm -hmm. but my wife has you know undertaken the challenge of making sourdough and getting a sourdough starter this thing is temperamental like i've never seen a more temperamental food item this thing takes more love and care than our two cats. Like yeah. she, she woke up last night. She just told me today, this morning, she said, yeah, I woke up last night and I checked it and I was so happy that it rose. I was like, this thing, you know, it is very temperamental. So if anybody out there, the reason I'm asking is if anyone out there has any tips on getting sourdough starter to really get kicked off on the right foot, please leave them on the comments. I'd love to share them with my wife and be the superhero to that, uh, that whole story. But I think she'll know that it's not coming from me. That It is what it is. And isn't making sourdough, isn't that like, wasn't that the big lockdown trend? Wasn't that one of those? It was. I, I think it was one of the like five or six top, let's do this in lockdown for COVID. But, you know, now that we actually have some time because you're not planning a wedding. And for those yeah. that haven't done it before, it takes over your life. So now that there's some time, that's that's one of her her new hobbies. And and man, I, I thought, okay, well, you're just gonna do it and it's gonna be just simple. I was foolish to think that. Mm-hmm. So uh regardless, if you have any tips, leave them in the comment section below. But let's get to the Pittsburgh Penguins for what because you know it's been an interesting offseason, definitely, uh, needless to say. And we were talking over text over the last couple of days about what we wanted to talk about. We only have the one segment because we pre-recorded the interview with State of Hoppy. And we said, okay, let's talk about the trade block. And we both looked at it and said, I don't know who could be on the trade block because before the summer started, it was Mikhail Granlin. He's gone. Jeff Petrie, he's gone. Jan Ruda, he's gone. Casey DeSmith, he's gone. There's really nobody left. I mean, even last year, you could say, oh, Ryan Paling, maybe. He's gone. So is there anybody on the Pittsburgh Penguins trade block entering training camp this season? It's it's tough to say if there is a definitive this player is on. Um, I think at this moment, it might just be a clean house. It is just um, the cupboard is bare. It will get filled as training camp, as the season goes on. And as the next trade deadline approaches, mm-hmm. um, the only name I think I might throw in there is just because of this. Because you at this point, just with how bare it is, you have to look at your rosters and go, all right, who's expendable? Like who can um, pretty much just be taken off? No harm, no foul. Uh, Ty Smith or P.O. Joseph come to mind right away. But again, those are two players you don't want to lose yet. They just Mm -hmm. aren't. You want, you want P.O. Joseph to succeed and you want to see what Ty Smith can do. Uh, And the big question that'll now come in is, okay, well, which who amongst this team on this roster is going to be a Kyle Dubas guy because he has every right to come in and just start clearing house. I mean, obviously he already did, (laughs) Um, but are, is this group right here, his guys? I mean, there's a couple of uh, Jim Rutherford signings even on here. 
that uh, could still be filtered in and out. Brian Rust comes to mind right away, except he's locked up with a no-move clause for the next two seasons. Um, so it'll be interesting to see who's next, just because of the way the NHL is, the way hockey is, it's a business. No matter what, no matter where your team is in the standings, there is always a next trade on the horizon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just don't know when it is and you don't know who it is. And that's kind of what we're trying to look at here. Yeah. And it's interesting. I want to get back to your P.O. Joseph and Ty Smith point, but it's interesting because there's so many new faces on this roster that you can't consider any of them on the trade block because they were literally just brought in and we haven't even seen them practice in an actual formal practice. Now, players have returned to Pittsburgh and begun skating at the Lemieux Complex just in informal skates, but there's not been an actual formal practice yet. And so much of this roster is brand spanking, right? Players that you're getting your first looks of them in black and gold in general. Even Eric Carlson, there was a picture I saw the other day of him in the Penguins practice gear, except he still has San Jose Sharks gloves. Like these guys are just arriving in Pittsburgh, so they're not going to be on the trade block. And the guys that stayed around, Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Brian Rust, you mentioned, has a full no-move clause, which means he's not going anywhere. Same thing goes for a guy like Jeff Carter. Yeah. The, the guys that are available to be moved in in quotation marks aren't guys you're going to move. And then the guys that you might want to move a Jeff Carter, even, you know, a drew O'Connor, but he just signed that contract and the penguins have such high hopes for drew O'Connor. There's just nobody on the list. You mentioned one of PO Joseph or Ty Smith. There is probably interest there around the league, but the important thing is even if Ty Smith, doesn't win the job, or even if P.O. Joseph doesn't win the job, you're going to need injury replacements. Mm-hmm. Specifically, you look at Ty Smith, when you have Eric Carlson and Chris Letang, who are your power play quarterbacks, if one of them goes down, it is so nice, and we saw it last season in his nine-game sample size, it is so nice to have a guy like Ty Smith who you can just plug and play on that first power play unit. Yeah, he's he's a good little option to have laying around. Um, you just have to hope he's able to get more than just nine games, just like the way we talked about Alex Nylander in the last episode. Um, You want him to prove his worth and show that he can do this, uh, and he's going to need more than the nine-game sample size to do so. Um, It's interesting to say that both Ty Smith and Alex Nylander, guys that the Penguins really want to see what they can do with them on the roster, only played nine games last year. Uh, And we were impressed in pretty much all nine of them, from both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I mean, it still is just going to randomly come down to just who's expendable. I mean, especially if we were closing on a training camp or exactly two weeks out, if Kyle Deuce makes another move, someone's going to become expendable, right? As in another move. I mean, it's another PTO coming in who has a legitimate shot at making the lineup. I mean, if Mark Mm -hmm. Pissick makes this lineup, Chad Ruedel's name probably jumps to the top of the list. Right. And even that you're not getting a huge return for. Yeah. I mean, he's a 33 year old on the last year of his contract that has spent the majority of his career as a seventh defenseman. Now, albeit he has been a very, very good seventh defenseman for the Pittsburgh Penguins over his time here. But yeah, that, again, that's, you know, that's the only name. And again, it's if Mark Pesic comes in and is undeniably a guy that you need to give a contract to. But even if, say, you know, a PTO like a Thomas Tatar, which that remains, you know, unresolved with a less than two weeks until most training camps begin he's not going to trade somebody away. He's going to try to put him through waivers. That way he has them in their back pocket. That is the, yeah. you know, an Alex Nylander, uh, a Rem Pitlick maybe is a guy that gets sent down, or at least they try to send down. I, I look at this as, you know, a good thing for, for Kyle Dubas. When you look at his first off season, whenever you have a lot of these new names, uh, of course, they're not going to be in the trade block, but he really cleared out a lot of the problem contracts for the Pittsburgh Penguins in a way that, I mean, most of them went out in one trade uh, and you brought back a guy that, you know, despite having $10 million on the cap for the next four years, already at the age of 33, Eric Carlson is a plus player. So uh, it's an impressive feat nonetheless in that aspect. But when we look at the broader strokes of the summer of Kyle Dubas, what was your you know most underrated move of Kyle Dubas this offseason? Because I feel like when everybody looks at his overall performance in his first couple of months as Penguins president and general manager, a lot of the grades are coming back A minus B plus, but I, I feel like it's it's closer to like an A A plus. I know nothing is kind of you can't really give an A plus until you see how it works out on the ice. But 
you know, from the actual narrative standpoint, he didn't make any false moves. And the closest thing to it might be the Jari move. But again, you can make arguments on either side of it. Yeah, you, you absolutely can. Uh, this, I, I think Kyle Dubas knocked it out of the park with every single movie made all summer. Maybe the Tristan Jari deal was a ground rule double. Let's leave that one at that, just because we need to see how it advances. Um, I, as as the as a standout underrated move, I don't know. Maybe Nola Chari for three years instead of one or two. I mean, Lars Eller he signed for two. Uh, Matt Nieto he signed for two at under a million. I don't love the price tag of two four five for Lars Eller for those two years. Um, but so be it. It's going to be a depth depth center that uh, two two million dollars won't. $2.5 million basically won't be noticed in the long run. Whereas Nolan Chari might become, I mean, yeah, he's a little older, he's 31 already, but for three more years at just $2 million flat, uh, modified no trade clause, by the way, in case anybody was curious about the trade block in him in a couple seasons, uh, that could be an interesting little depth piece. I mean, we're still looking for that. The Penguins have always been looking for that chemistry of the Bluger, Aston Reese, Tanev line. And I don't think we might have that exact same thing with this group, but there could be a little something there for the uh, for the fans that love good depth options and good depth pieces that uh, know their roles. There's plenty of options for that in this uh, setup. And also, I think any of those depth signings that are fighting for uh, roster spots, those are going to be some of the quiet hitters in this uh, in Kyle Dubas' summer as well. Yeah, I was going to mention two names here, and, and one of them I've talked about, I, I feel like, a little bit more than most people, and that's Andreas Janssen. And the other name is Vinny Hinnestroza. You know, mm-hmm. Hinnestroza is somebody that I honestly have forgotten a couple times that was signed to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And here's the thing. I've put a lot on Andreas Janssen expecting him to get back to his Toronto Maple Leafs days, but that's the good thing about signing two of these guys is you don't have to worry about one hitting and that being your only swing at the, you know, you only crack at the can. You have Vinny Henestrosa as well, who's shown to be a, a pretty solid NHL player and somebody that could, in a new role or at least in a new atmosphere, could take it and become a decent bottom six piece for the Pittsburgh Penguins. So I like the fact that, you know, Kyle Dubas didn't say, okay, here are our bottom six signings and they're going to figure it out about who of the six of them are going to fit in where. He brought in more. He brought in those two. He brought in you know, redeem Zahorna. I don't have high expectations for redeem Zahorna, but again, it's somebody the Penguins liked in training camp last year. He went to two other organizations and then he's going to get another kick at the can here in Pittsburgh. And it's, it's also players that allow you to watch your young prospects about Terry Pustin and Sam pool not have to be forced up due to injuries and not have to be interfered with when it comes to their progression. Obviously, Poulain played a little bit last year in the NHL, but his progression was hindered by some of the time he took off last year. We don't know where he's at and where he stands heading into this season. So it's going to be interesting to watch who gets the call first from these minor league guys. You know, Does Lucas Svedkovsky get an opportunity at the NHL level in his second pro season? I don't know. I, I think I'd like to talk to somebody who, who was a little bit more focused on the AHL about Lucas Fedkovsky's uh, rookie year last year. But, you know, there's a lot of options for the Pittsburgh Penguins. We keep saying that options, options, competition, options. But realistically, I think that makes the Penguins so much different this year than they have been in seasons past. Yeah, it, there's it, we could discuss the options till the cows come home and we still will finish up and go, oh, another one. Because while you were sitting here, I remembered, oh, yeah, Will Butcher is also in this de- as a depth option. Sure, he's kind of locked up on the left side where there's a ton of names. But, I mean, Kyle Dubas did a good job of bringing in former New Jersey Devils defenseman that should be pretty solid, mm-hmm. i.e. Will Butcher, who knows if he gets back on the, on the grind. Ty Smith, who we already discussed a couple times in this episode, and Ryan Graves, who is going to be the new number one left side. So <laughs> we built an all-star team of – New Jersey Devils defenseman, but <laughs> it's it is what it is. Kyle Dubas had a great summer, and you write those options. And again, we'll continue listing names and finish up, and still realize that we missed a couple of guys here already. It's that's how big this uh, camp is going to be, and how imp- how fun this camp is going to be to watch too. Mm-hmm. Not to you, not that he's a Kyle Dubas guy, but a name that you usually like to bring up is Xavier Willette. He's still in the minors somewhere as well, and he would have been brought up over Taylor Fadoon last year if yeah. he was healthy. So, you know, again, 
it's an option down there. He might be the 12th or 13th defenseman, but hey, he's the 12th or 13th defenseman that has NHL experience. He's the Wiley veteran down there alongside Taylor Fadoon. And, you know, when there's injuries and there will be injuries, these guys provide the Penguins with less of a drop off than you would have otherwise. So yeah. uh, a solid job by Kyle Dubas. I'm sure we'll continue to, to break it down as the results start to come in, meaning the season is about to start. The NFL season starts tonight. Fall is in the air, although it is 98 degrees in Northern Virginia right now. So uh, fall is not really in the air, but fall is in our, our minds, at least uh, in this section of the country. But we're going to take a quick break when we return. I was joined by State of Hoppy earlier this week to talk a little bit more about the summer of Kyle Dubas. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm joined now by a very special guest, recurring guest, friend of the show, and co-host of the Soda Pod, not to mention an avid fan of all things Rem Pitlick. We welcome on State of Hoppy. What's going on, Hoppy? Oh, man, I got to say, your uh, little intro video that plays there, I'm like so jacked up right now because I don't think I can possibly watch the Chris Kunitz double OT goal without just like getting all of the adrenaline. So we're good. Yeah, it is certainly one that when you look at it, you always immediately remember where you were. I was in the basement of an apartment in Oakland that was basically a dungeon, but I was losing my mind. Oh, dude, that I don't think that there is a Pittsburgh memory that like gives me more happy feelings than that one. And you got to think about not only did that propel the Pittsburgh Penguins into their second straight Stanley Cup final, but it effectively slammed the door on Eric Carlson ever getting a Stanley Cup in Ottawa and now the door's wide open once again back in Pittsburgh so all things coming around town look at us <laughs> well obviously I think that's a good place to start right there I mean the Penguins made that huge splash move just about a month ago to acquire Eric Carlson but not a lot of people are thinking about the other player that was bring in brought in alongside Carlson which was Rem Pitlick. What do you think his ceiling is as a member of the Pittsburgh Penguins? You know, we've been referring to it as the Rem Pitlick trade and Eric Carlson's <laughs> the side piece. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean, the ceiling, the ceiling is quite high. Like this is a guy that has the offensive pedigree to play in the top six. The floor is also very low. So like temper your expectations, but this is a guy that's shown it at every level. I mean, obviously coming up through Shattuck, he flirted just over or under being a point of game player for his three years at the university of Minnesota. And it's kind of been a slow ramp up that he had to do to get finally a little bit of NHL work Dude, with the Minnesota wild. It was one of those things where he just kind of got pigeonholed. Like a lot of Minnesota wild prospects do. He was on the fourth line. Most of the time occasionally got spot duty on the third line and still managed to put up 11 points in 20 games. And then Bill Guerin said, I'm going to wave you. And that sucked. Yeah, it seems like he just needs an opportunity to stick somewhere. He needs an opportunity <laughs> as you pan over to the Rem Pitlick jersey right behind you. I not, love not it. Not just a Rem Pitlick jersey. I that see is a Rem Pitlick right jersey there. that was signed by Bill Guerin saying, <laughs> I'm sorry I waved Rem. That's amazing. You yes. and your Bill Guerin stories, do you have to have at least a half dozen? Uh, I think it's only three or four. I don't know. But well, you're getting I'll take there. a half dozen. I'll take it. Yeah. Well, well by the end of this hockey season, we got to get you to at least that half dozen. We got to get you to at least six. But no. We can only uh, help. With Pitlick, it seems like he just needs an opportunity to get a steady opportunity to play with offensive play drivers. And of course, no better offensive play driver on the Pittsburgh Penguins than Sidney Crosby, who just happens to have a vacancy on his left side for their first couple of games. I would expect Rem Pitlick to be heavily in that rotation of players that are going to get that opportunity to fight for that position out of camp, don't you? Uh, I mean, depending on what Sullivan's thinking here, right? Because yeah. that it's pretty easy to do the old copy-paste and bring in Brian Rust. 
but mm. I, I don't know what their plans are looking forward. I think we've all kind of cemented Riley Smith alongside of Kenny Malkin. And I wonder what the better path forward is for the team. Do you put rust up with Crosby, use what's tried and true and have a line that can drive play offensively, but also be pretty sound defensively. Or do you put Pitlick with two guys that can play a solid defensive game to kind of cover up for where he's most heavily lacking. Right. But as far as the offense is concerned, yeah, I have no concerns that he could step in and absolutely fit in alongside either of the top two lines, but Mm -hmm. you are going to have to cover up for defensive deficiencies there. And I don't know if you just make the second line a black hole that goes out there just to score. That's probably a scary proposition. And it also means that it's a lot harder for Pitlick, you know, once we're all healthy, I don't know if he's going to be a guy that you want to put on your third line. So it's, it's a weird juggling that we're going to have to do here. I just hope rust on the third line would be great. If it can work out. I don't mean to bury the guy because he hasn't even laced them up for an actual practice for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but that sounds an awful lot like a Dominic Simone. Ah, I mean, I mean, just in the sense that, Hey, if he's not on your first line, I find it hard to have him on the sure. third line. That's what I mean. Not as much of the See, everything but score that Dom Simone. He's, he's a he's a Dom Simone, but here's the ceiling and the floor, and we're just gonna spread these hands even more. Like <laughs> he's he's got more ceiling, but lower floor. So yes, as far as the fit in the roster, I I'm with you, but. Mm-hmm. I think there is a lot more that he can contribute offensively rather than just being the guy that's like getting open and like being available to do whatever Crosby tells him. Like I think Pitlick can be a guy that actually drives some of that play again, if he gets put into a position to do so. Yeah. So that, so that's Pitlick and obviously everybody knows what Eric Carlson is expected to bring. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but what was your favorite off season addition other than those two that came over in that singular trade? That's not how you phrased it in the message. God damn it. Um, <laughs> man, other than those two, I mean, <laughs> is it cheating to say that it's about who we got rid of instead? I mean, <laughs> listen, I, I, I gave my rankings and I'll have to go back and find them on uh, Twitter. I'll even see if I can pull it up here real quick, but I, I don't think there was a more important move, which of course coincided as part of the Carlson trade that no one expected to see Dubas fleece that hard, <laughs> but getting that Grandland contract moved and literally like having no repercussions for doing so is insane to me. I don't understand how Dubas was able to pull this off. Yeah. When you look at the the roster and how different it would be if they had to eat that $5 million, I mean, it wouldn't have happened. There's no way you could have made that work where you still had Grandland on this team, but even if he was and salary cap aside, with the team that is currently constructed, there's no fit for him. I mean, you could talk about Jeff Carter in the same light that there's no actual fit for him. And you could see a roster without that player there, but then you bring the salary cap into it and you just say, how do you keep him out of the lineup? So to be able in Dubas's shoes to just completely rid yourself of that, I agree. The addition by subtraction on that level is tremendous and it is massive for the Penguins. Yeah, and so here's here's my list of uh, power ranking the trade pieces. Number one, moving Granlund. Number two, adding Rem. Number three, adding Carlson. Number four, moving Petrie. Number five, not moving POJ. Number six, moving to Smith. Number seven, moving Ruda. <laughs> Number eight, moving Lake Gray. <laughs> Number nine, moving 2025 second and number 10 moving 2024 first. So I guess I should have asked you what your 11th favorite move was this off season. And then I said, Dubis Christ has come to absolve us of Hextall's sins. So uh, I think Dubis Christ is something that we could get moving. Yeah. I think that's something, you know, you you throw a hashtag out there on the X or whatever it is at this point, (laughs) maybe you get a little bit of a, you know, a backing there. Maybe a t-shirt needs to come out, you know, Dubis Christ, I think if I, if I see him work. at the Frozen Four this year, I'll definitely throw that as well. There you go. I mean, say, hey, you know, I got, I got an idea for you, and you can take it back to the Penguins if you'd like. You know, Pens gear, pay attention, and there you go. 
Dude, I, I met him at the Frozen Four in Tampa this year, and now he's with Pittsburgh. I'm magic. Yep, nos for state of poppy ought to. I don't know how to make that sound better, but that's the closest I can get. But uh, if only I could use it to like positively impact my personal life <laughs> someday. Hey, you just got to open a t-shirt shop. That's that's as easy as that. That I don't think you even intended that to be mean, but it. <laughs> given that our account was hacked like six months ago by a t-shirt company, okay, that was yeah. intentional. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. Yeah, if if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to at soda pod no no not... at soda pod is the one that you want to oh, go to that's that's the real oh, one I, I know i meant go okay. to at soda pod and just <laughs> check what their their bio says right now check out what their bio <laughs> says but uh no when it comes to the pittsburgh penguins the one guy that i look at and i've, I've mentioned is ryan graves uh, i don't know what your sure. opinion is on ryan graves but to be able to go out there and get the best defensive defenseman in my eyes on the market is something, you know, especially to replace Brian Dumlin, who was fading and in that position for so many years, to be able to go out and get somebody that is so much like him, but younger and more in his prime, I, I thought was an absolute home run and an absolute steal by Dubas. It's nuts, man, that honestly, like, that's just like blended into like distant memory at this point. Like with yeah. all the excitement around the Carlson deal, I, I, I'm just like, oh yeah, Graves has just been part of this team. It is what it is. But no, that that was an incredible pickup. And <clears throat> obviously the back end of these contracts, we don't even give a shit at this point, right? Because we're looking at two to four years where we're pushing it. I think he's a great fit. I mean, even before the Carlson trade, but now looking at our top four, you got Graves and Latang more than likely and Pedersen Carlson. Like, I don't know what more you can ask for there. It's just what's going to happen on the third pair yeah and i even look at that third pairing and they're going to get so little playing time that the actual responsibility for them is going to be minuscule and with that you mentioned somebody a couple minutes ago pierre olivier joseph had a really good first full season as an nhler if he's able to build on that and especially if they play him with a guy like i don't know i talked about this on monday's penguins to go but a guy like ty smith who if he earns that right side job you could really tell po joseph to listen don't worry about the transition game. Don't worry about the offensive game that we know is something that you've been working on. Just be a stay-at-home defenseman. What does that do for the psyche of a guy like Pierre-Olivier Joseph, who now has the confidence of having a 75-game season under his belt, where he played with not one, not two, not three, but four different defensemen, all in some serious amount of playing time, to be able to say, listen, you are, have one guy, he's going to help you tremendously on transition, and you be that stay-at-home guy. What does that transform POJ into? I think that would become, you know, an interesting storyline in 2023. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to where his head's at, right? Because, yeah. like, imagine being a guy that really projects better as being that transition, move puck up the ice type of guy. Does he look at this and say, like, no, that's that's my role. That's what I want to do. I'm sure with a team like this that's got the leadership, that has Sullivan, like, He's going to fall in line. It's just like, is he going to be dragged through it or is he going to embrace it? If he embraces it, it's not only a great way for him to develop and grow his game, but it puts us in a great spot with that third pairing then because you do have yet one more pairing of defense paired with offense. So it, it's interesting. I'm just not sure where his head's at. And, you know, we've seen it in spurts, but do we trust that he can be a, a reliable, sturdy, stay-at-home-esque defenseman if that's what he's called to do. Yeah, that ends up being the, the primary question with him, because even if he plays with a guy like Chad Ruweedle, now, of course, Mark Pesek changes the entire you know landscape of what that could look like. But if he's paired with a guy like Chad Ruweedle, I don't think his responsibilities change all that much compared to what he would have to be with uh, maybe a Ty Smith. I think that, yeah, Ty Smith's a little bit more volatile and definitely much more you know high speed and high engine and high motor than a Chad Ruweedle. But I think Ruweedle doesn't bring that much more defensive impact than a Ty Smith, who I thought looked in nine games, small sample size, looked much better in his own zone than what was projected of him when he came over from New Jersey. I think that's what needs to be talked about more, right? Like everyone knows that paid any attention. Smith should have been on the roster to start last year. Yeah. And it, it purely came down to the logistics of, you know, he could be sent down. POJ would have to go through waivers. That's not something that we could handle. So, sorry, Smith, you're going down. 
I think he has way more offensive upside. And I think that there is more defense there than people will give him credit for. He's just kind of been painted as a defense or an offense only guy. I don't know what that's going to yield. And when you put him and POJ together, I don't know. You could get one of the best third pairings in the league. You could get a dumpster fire. And I'm, I'm not really sure. But if that's our biggest concern, we're in a good spot. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's the biggest concern. So <laughs> we'll see. Well, the biggest concern could be between the pipes for the Pittsburgh Penguins, particularly if the guy that they signed to a five-year, $5.37 million contract can't stay on the ice for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And of course, we're talking about Tristan Jari. How much do you trust that Jari can not only stay healthy, but can handle the responsibility of a workhorse number one goaltender in this league? Well, we got to dissect that a little bit. Okay. First off, I don't think those are one and the same. Like, do I trust him to stay healthy? Thus far, he's done nothing to prove that he can. If he can stay healthy, what do you see being a workhorse load? Like, how many games are we talking? I'm looking at what he did in 2020-21, I believe. No, 2021-22, when he played, I believe it was 60-some games, 63 games before getting injured against the Islanders. Sure. I I think that if healthy for the entire season, because, again, we saw it last year, like, his season was derailed because he had an early injury that he tried to play through, and that kind of derailed everything. If he can have a clean bill of health throughout the year, I do think that he has the talent. I think he's there mentally. I think he can handle 60-ish games, yes. But that's if he can stay healthy, and I don't know if that's yeah. going to happen. My biggest thing, too, I mean, you look at the defense, and while, yes, you, you lose – Brian Dumoulin, who is an underrated, really big body, but you bring in Ryan Graves, you look at the rest of the defense, it's not really a bunch of guys that are going to keep the opposing forces off of Tristan Jari and out of the front of the net. That plays a big factor and a, a big role in whether or not Jari is able to actually stay out on the ice. Now, the hip injury is something that I don't know who, who to believe because Jari comes out in, in his press conference after signing that contract and says, listen, I don't know where you guys got the word chronic from, but it was never described as a chronic injury behind closed doors. Now, and whether Jonathan or not Taylor says that he's not injured and then he starts the season on the pup list. So it, like he exactly. So it's, and he's saying, Oh, I'll be a hundred percent for camp. I'll be a hundred percent for the start of the season. If he indeed is 100%, then staying a hundred percent. I don't think I have that big of a worry, yeah. but if he is not a hundred percent, that's when I have concern. And again, uh, I don't know who to trust. Well, I don't, I, I don't know if I, I can, I, I can't trust, trust dollars. I trust the dollars. Dude, if Dubas isn't giving him that contract, if he doesn't think he's ready for game one. Now, that's true. whether he stays healthy, again, completely different story. Yeah. But I can't imagine him being questionable to start the year and throwing that contract when there were other goalie options out there. But were there? Like, to that level. I, I understand no, that you could. That level, but yeah. I, I think if you move on from him and you decide to go more of the tandem route, which we've seen a lot of success in the NHL of late, right? Like, yes. look at what the Hurricanes do year in and year out. No one's making big boy bucks. They can all get the job done. They can all be the number one. They can all also be a 1A or 1B. So, like, I think there were options out there. Plus, obviously, this is before Carlson was traded for, but there was always the potential of, you know, moving on a guy like Hellebuck, which I don't know how he's still with the team when he said he's not coming back. Same not, thing with Shifley. That's pretty yeah, bizarre. Not just him. But you look at all those other goaltenders that were rumored to be on their way out. I mean, UC Soros is still in Nashville. I know that that wasn't the, the most hotly debated, like, he needs to be out of there. Right. John Gibson straight up said, I will not play another game for the Anaheim Ducks. I He's love, still love, on their love organization. John Gibson two years ago. I'd be a little scared if we put all the eggs in that basket. Exactly. And, but you know, you never know. But yeah. I, for me, I don't know. We can go back and forth on his health all day. Yeah. I think if he's healthy, I do trust him. Mm -hmm. And I also think that a lot of people are down, understandably so, on Adelkovic. He has a way higher ceiling than to Smith. But again, oh. kind of the Rem Pitlick discussion, there's a little bit lower of a floor, but I don't think it's that much lower than to Smith's. Right. No, when when DeSmith was bad, DeSmith was really bad. That I mean, was I, usually only if he was the number one, right? Like when he was playing the true backup role, we didn't see that many of the like brutal DeSmiths. Mm -hmm. The only time that we saw that 
was the beginning of that season that I mentioned a few minutes ago in 2021-22, which is why Tristan Jari ended up with over 60 games played and yet didn't play at all in the last four weeks of the season because sure. DeSmith was so bad early in that season that Tristan Jari was forced to play <laughs> almost every single game. So yeah. that was the only time that I could imagine that. But, I mean, last season, called him coin flip Casey for a reason. You're either getting a guy that could be a number one or maybe even a high-end 1B, or you're getting a guy that should probably be playing on the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. So yeah. it, it's it's something where, yeah, you bring in Nadelkovic. I'm not exactly sure where Magnus Helberg is at in all of this. I feel like sure. he's a better option than Dustin Tokarski. He's a better option than Maxime Lagasse. Maybe similar to like peak Louis Domingue. But, you know, I, I do think that there's a chance that Helberg was brought in for a very specific reason, and it was to be not just a number three, maybe a, a low-end or mid-tier number two as well. And, I mean, Jerry goes down, right? And, yes, I'm calling him Jerry. I'm convinced. <laughs> I heard it pronounced that way once when he was a prospect, and he literally has Jerry from Tom and Jerry on his helmet. And have we not seen in Pittsburgh lore guys who we think are Sherry and become Sherry? I'm standing by it until proven wrong by Tristan Jerry himself. <laughs> it's Jerry, not Jari. Um, but worst case scenario, he goes down. I feel like there's a goalie out there that could be had push come to shove. I think most Pittsburgh Penguin fans are very familiar with him. In fact, <laughs> most like him way more than they should. Yeah, I don't know who you could ever be alluding to in that sense. Maybe, you know, somebody that used to play for the team. Maybe somebody that has nicer teeth than I do. Nicer teeth than most, Great honestly. Teeth. And somebody that would probably cost the Pittsburgh Penguins a lot of money when it came to actual clear tape, considering all the pranks that he goes through. Oh, yeah, that's that's Mark andre Fleury. I mean, I think you can handle that sunk cost. Uh, yeah, and I also think prices go down during the season. Like you're, you're talking, we're talking about on clear tape. Really? No, <laughs> I, I meant on <laughs> goaltenders, uh, specifically no, ones that are not, you know, the young stud that is Philip Gustafson for the Minnesota wild. Yeah. And I mean, you got a lot of things working in your favor when it comes to, you know, will flurry be available or not. Yeah. It could very much become the Phil Gustafson show that yeah. has very much yet to be proven, but he's at least got that potential. Mm hmm. You've also got the guy waiting in the wings who is currently far and away the best goaltending prospect in the NHL, Jesper Falstead, and he could push to come up and be part of a 1A, 1B tandem. I think that's a bad idea. I think regardless, he needs to stay down in Iowa for this season. But then there's also the possibility that the Wild bottom out. It could be a bad year. Everyone in the Central got better except for them. Their only acquisition was technically a deadline acquisition, which I do still think season long could make a big difference in Marcus Johansson, but mm -hmm. you never know if a couple injuries or things just don't go their way. If they're out of it, flurry has gone after this year. And if he's open to that move, Bill Guerin will do it to clear some cap space and get, you know, some pieces back in return. I don't know. I think the possibilities there, do I think it's the likely path? Not necessarily, but do I think it's drastically below a 50% possibility? Also, no. Yeah, and just a reminder for those in the comments, Hoppy did preface that with, if Jari or Jerry goes down with injury, because the Penguins can't afford it, nor is it realistic if the Penguins still have Tristan Jari and everybody yeah. else well, and on also, team healthy. If, if you want to assure that Tristan Jerry is totally... I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on here. We'll just say uh, messed up in the head. Bring Flurry back and see what that does for his confidence. That'll go really well, especially when the first bad game he has, the fans are going to start chanting for Flurry. Like, yeah, that's a horrible idea if Jerry is still healthy. <laughs> yeah. But if he goes down, eh, worse things could happen. I was about to say, you could have worse options to fall back on than a future Hall of Famer. But before we let you go, I do want to ask, with all the changes that were made by Kyle Dubas, and you mentioned, you know, names being different, and his introductory press conference, he was called Kyle Dubas by somebody from Fenway Sports Group. I was getting worried that I was pronouncing that wrong for the past seven years, but as far as we know, it's Kyle Dubas. With all the moves that he made, do you see the Penguins as a playoff team heading into the 2023 season? 
I mean, obviously, this is a big assumption of health, right? Yes. Yeah. I say yes. Um, I think there's still a lot to be seen with settling out the bottom six for the Minnesota Wild, or wow, for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But I, I really, I think the pieces are there. Mm-hmm. It's gonna settle in at some point. It's just, does it settle in in the first month, or does it take three? Right. But I just, I, quite frankly, I've banged this drum for a little bit. The New York Rangers just don't scare me. I know. I think they're fraudulent. I think the only reason they beat the Pittsburgh Penguins in the playoffs the other year is because we got Tom Wilson 2.0 and Jacob Truba deciding to throw chicken wings at everyone's face and injuries basically led to the downfall. And we were playing with a third string goalie and it still took them seven games. I think they're losers. I don't think they've got anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the biggest hurdle is going to be does more than three teams even get in from the Metro because the Atlantic, like make no mistake, they're still all good teams. Like everyone thinks Boston's just going to like dwindle away to nothing. No, they're going to be worse, but worse than 135 points could still be pretty good. Yeah. You've got the emergence of the Buffalo Sabres who I think make the playoffs this year with one of the wild card spots. You don't know what Florida is going to be once all of their injuries wrap up. And then of course you've still got Tampa and Toronto pacing it. I think the only guarantees with health, of course, in the Metro are Carolina and New Jersey. Outside of that, it's up for grabs. Oh, and the other guarantee is that Philly sucks, which is scary because the top couple of guys in this draft class are going to be really good. So Mm -hmm. that scares me a little bit. But outside of that, every team is in play, which could help or hurt because it could balance the playing field. And there's more losses for teams like New York that we're vying with. But it also means it's going to be a lot tougher for Pittsburgh to climb in the standings if they've got to go against those matchups. I put them as my number three, but that's not like by leaps and bounds by any means. But I think if healthy, the way the roster is currently constructed, I'll take them over Washington. I'll take them over New York. I'll take them over the other New York and I'll take them over Columbus. Yeah. Well, there you have it. State of Hoppy says the Pittsburgh Penguins are a playoff team. And I tend to agree uh, going into the season, especially if healthy, you know, if healthy, if healthy <laughs> that's, you know, let, I should just put an healthy asterisk. Relative. Like, obviously, there will be injuries, right? Every yeah. team is going to deal with injuries. It's more so as long as none of the key players are out for more than, you know, 10 games this year. Yeah. I I don't see how they miss. But that's why we watch the games. There you have it. Well, Hoppy, before we let you go, I want to give you a couple seconds. What's coming up on the Soda Pod? Also, MNCAA. Did I say that correct? Ooh, yeah. There you go. There you What's go. coming up on those platforms from State of Hoppy? Yeah, so anyone that's interested in just like NHL prospects at large, every Thursday evening, we're going to say, I'm going to do math, 7 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we do a live stream for Judd's Buds, which is our guy Spoked Z doing anything prospects. We definitely highlight the wild prospects the best we can, but his main focus is prepping for next year's draft class. Mm. And we're already underway. We've already kind of broken down some of the top 15 to 20 that we expect to be there next year. We're going to be following them all the way. MNCAA, it's just the six division one programs in Minnesota. Obviously, Gophers going to be a fun one to watch again this year, even though Logan Cooley broke my heart and went out to Arizona. Uh, but we've got coverage insiders from all six teams. And then Soda Pod is just me and Isha being idiots, drinking beer, talking NHL at large, and uh, the Minnesota Wild. He'll probably cry several times over Pedersen probably leaving after this year, which is going to be really fun to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Again, uh, that's all that I cover, but my first love was definitely the Pittsburgh Penguins, so... Always fun to jump on here with you, Berlansky, to talk a little bit about it. And uh, that that at least gets my like fix for a month or two here. We're good. Yeah, we got we to gotta get you on a little bit more frequently throughout the season. Always appreciate your time. Always appreciate your insight. And the next time you're on, you know, we got to get Horwat. Where, 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 where yeah, the heck? Where is he at? You know, yeah, left, left me hanging tonight. But uh, regardless... It's because you told me I was coming on. <laughs> it's 100% that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and but, everyone remember what Nick said. It's at Soda Pod. At, at the Soda. Soda Pod, you're going to see a lot of great t-shirt options. Not great, but uh, yeah, appreciate it. And with that, 
that closes out another episode of the tip of the iceberg thank you to everybody for tuning in remember you can get us wherever you get your podcast from you can get our writing at inside the penguins.com or you can watch us on inside the penguins on youtube make sure to like share subscribe all that fun stuff we'll see you guys next time